Elden Ring is one of the most absolutely gorgeous games I have ever laid eyes on. I imagine that'll be the least controversial thing I have to say in this critique, and there's a good reason for it. Elden Ring is a strong example of a game that will visually age like fine wine, and that's down to the fact that it's not going for ultra-realism. Instead, it's going for being grounded enough to immerse oneself in, but with an artistic direction and style that allow it to stand out in the sea of modern AAA sludge that prioritizes ultra-realism above all else. From games have never been exceptional graphically, but they've always managed to make up for it with artistic direction that manages to be as enchanting as it is terrifying. Demon Souls on the PS3 may look rough by modern standards, but the Dragon God will always be intimidating. Alant will always be menacing. The Storm King will always invoke a sense of awe, and the Maneaters will always invoke a sense of terror. Not only that, but the lands of Boletaria, Stonefang, Latria, the Shrine of Storms, and the Valley of Defilement will always stand out as iconic in their own rights. FromSoft games are, and always have been, proof that a game doesn't need to have especially mind-blowing visual fidelity to be visually memorable. All that a game truly needs in this regard is a distinguishable style and artistic direction, and Elden Ring has that in spades. Hell, it might even be the peak of FromSoft's catalog in all honesty, and that's coming from somebody who is obsessed with the art of Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, and Dark Souls 3, with Bloodborne being among my favorite games of all time. I should also note that I am a complete and total slut for anything Lovecraft, so hey, they got that going for them. Part of what I think makes Elden Ring so visually strong are the character designs. Standard enemies are just that. They're standard, as they should be. But they also have a surprising amount of detail that you can intuit sometimes even without realizing it, as well as their own very distinct tones of presentation. All of the soldier and knight enemies from the Soldier of Godric to the Crucible Knight have a vast level of intricacy detailing their armor and various weapons. The grandiose appearances of the more powerful knights and warriors do well to provide distinctions between themselves and the more typical rank and file while also conveying a strong sense of regality. These designs are every bit as prestigious as knights should be, while also refraining from being over-designed or visually noisy, which is always appreciated. They feel fantastical enough to impress, but not so ungrounded that you have to actively engage in a suspension of disbelief. Then there are those less royally clad humanoid enemies, including the Bloodhound Knights, the Black Knife Assassins, the Spellcasters of Raya Lucaria, the Warriors of Zaymor, the Fire Cultists, the Miners, and who even knows how many more. Right off the bat, all of these designs are immediately distinguishable from any other humanoid enemy in the game for one reason or another, which is also great mechanically for allowing the player to identify and subsequently recognize these enemies in successive encounters. This is, of course, crucial for the player to be able to do, given the sheer variety in their movesets and just how dangerous some of these enemies can be depending on your level of progression. Then there are the beastly enemies such as the demi-humans, the trolls, the chanting winged dames, the beast Men, the dragons, and so on. All of these creatures feel very well realized, and their physical appearances all seeming to possess certain quirks and details which reflect how they've been affected by the world they preside in. Not only does this allow for even the most minor enemies to have a sense of characterization, but it simultaneously lends back to the world, showing us just how impactful events like the Shattering were to inhabitants as far as the Weeping Peninsula. Then there are those enemies which are just downright horrific. The Kindred of Rot, the Worm Faces, the Cemetery Shades, the Revenants, the Air Tree Avatars, the Ulcerated Tree Spirits, the Abductors, the Finger Creepers, and many, many, many more. These kinds of enemies range from revolting to disturbing to utterly unsettling, and as a fan of all things horror, I must say I'm quite a fan. Seriously, when Elden Ring wants to be, it can be absolutely horrifying at times. And these enemy designs are downright stellar. Really, the only visual designs I didn't care for as far as the enemies were the malformed dogs and the birds. I get what they were going for, and in some ways they do work, but I honestly just find them too silly to take seriously. The proportions are just far too off balance, and not in a way that goes the route of downright body horror. It'd be one thing if these creatures were visibly suffering, but really these transformations don't seem to have slowed them down. Like, at all. If anything, they're more dangerous. The Bloodbirds of Mogwin Palace almost hit the nail on the head, but again, the proportions are just... 
I don't know, it feels like if they'd been toned down slightly, these enemies would have been pretty damn scary. As it stands, they're more weird and kind of goofy than anything, though I admit that is pretty subjective. Also, can I just say how fucking cool this dog is? Then there are the bosses, and I know, I know, I've been talking a lot about bosses throughout this critique, but if we're gonna talk about the artistic direction and visuals, how are we not gonna talk about some of these bosses? Some of the standouts for me personally include, you guessed it, Placidus Axe and Godfrey, but also the Elden Beast, Estelle, Melenia, the Crystallians, Riker, and everyone's favorite allegation defeater, Mo. I know I like to dick ride Placidus Axe, and hey, who can really shade me for hopping on that double bad dragon? That shit takes courage, am I right? But I don't think anyone is going to try and deny that Placidus Axe might just be one of the coolest looking dragons in From's catalog. It's literally Old Man Monster Zero. The degree at which he's become so decrepit is honestly as tragic as it is revolting, and yet there's an undeniable grace and mystique in the way he moves, despite the fact fact that he is likely eons old. Plus, I mean, come on, the red lightning and gravity beams are fucking radiant. To quote a wise man, it is gloriously incandescent. Wait a second, if Placidus Axe's heads have different genders and Lanciax and Fortis Axe had human forms, what would the human form of Placidus Axe look like? Can we make Placidus Axe the next gender fluid androgynous icon? Hail Placidus Axe. Then there's Godfrey and oh my god would you look at this absolute unit. I never thought, in all my years of being a gamer, that I would behold such a chat of a chungus, but here we are. Men hate him because they want to be him. I'm men, and man, I ain't him. In all seriousness, I think there's a reason why this one particular piece of art, even you who is only listening to this in the background knows exactly the art that I am talking about, is as popular as it is. The mix of navy blue and gold was definitely the right call for Godfrey's armor. Not only is the armor badass, but he also has Sarosh. Let's be real, Godfrey is just cool as hell, but Sarosh makes him approximately 11 billion times more badass. The dude has a fucking lion spirit hanging off of his back so as to keep his bloodlust in check. Combine that with his enormous great axe and that perfectly braided beard. What the fuck, dude, why are you so cool? And honestly, you'll never be this cool. Unironically, Godfrey is the Elden Chad. Nobody in this game or any of its sequels will ever be this fucking cool. No wonder Queen Merica chose him as her first consort. Hell, boy, got me feeling some type of way too. Then again, I don't know if my body is ready for that, especially if he goes in without prote- I mean, Sarosh. Anyways, Elden Beast. Putting aside the fact that this is probably the worst boss in the game. His almighty slugginess is incredible on a visual level. I've heard some criticize Elden Beast's appearance as not feeling as if it belongs in Elden Ring. However, I disagree. I do have my issues with it, but let's start with positives. Elden Beast is basically an incarnation of an outer god, and the golden roots surrounded by a mass of space and stars is both fitting and genuinely unique. I don't know if I've ever seen an enemy design quite like this, at least not in games that I've played over the years. I think where it might go wrong for most people is the shape and frame. It's kind of a meme to call the Elden Beast a slug, but truth be told, I have no idea what to really try and frame this thing as. That might seem fitting for a Lovecraftian god, but nothing about the Elden Beast really harmonizes in a way that a creature like Cthulhu or Nyarlathotep does. The long neck and head just looks weird coming off of the Elden Beast's very bulbous body. And I don't mean fascinatingly weird so much as just... I don't know, it's just weird. It also has these lanky, long arms with really long fingers that look strangely human, and yeah, that doesn't really match either. Combine that with the many wings that sprout from its back, and it's difficult to tell what they were really going for. It feels like Mr. Potato Head with parts from other toys put on it. I don't know, for a god of order and perfection, this is a pretty messy design. Again, I think the mix of the celestial night sky and the golden roots was absolutely the perfect call as far as the internal details, but the external form definitely needed more time in the oven. I could see it working, but the final product is just weird, and not in a way that's very befitting of a Lovecraftian-inspired design. Speaking of Lovecraftian designs, let's talk about Estelle. It's phenomenal. This is by far Elden Ring's most bizarre design, and I love it. You've probably noticed that Elden Ring does a lot of what I'll refer to simply as celestial compression, where celestial bodies are made notably smaller than they realistically would be. The ancient city and the underground wells would be the most obvious example. These aren't real stars, of course. The lore just says that sorcerers created the visage of stars across an eternal night sky as punishment to the Nox for insulting the Greater Will. Similarly, Estelle's body seems to be made of 
small stars, planets, and even nebulas, although the reason it looks like that is completely unknown, at least at the time of me writing this. It's more than likely that there really is no reason, after all, that's kind of the Lovecraftian shtick. Why does the moon presence look like that? Why does Abriatus look like that? We can come up with reasons to justify it as a design, but canonically, there's very little sense to finding a reason why a stell looks the way that it does. It'd be like asking why purple looks like purple and not yellow. It just does. Or maybe why we evolved to look the way we do. We just did. As otherworldly and nonsensical as Estelle's design appears to be, it manages to pull off its mix of design elements quite well. It sort of resembles a scorpion or a moth, but the head resembles a human skull with mandibles and its limbs look almost human, but also not quite. In fact, they kind of look like the limbs of the amygdala from Bloodborne. Estelle's proportions line up while also being just so off that you can't help but raise an eyebrow as you try to examine it. I think the best summation of Estelle's visual design that I can give is that there's so much about it that just doesn't make sense, yet simultaneously feels like it could if we just had the right answers. That's pretty much exactly where you want to land when designing Lovecraft. You can identify and associate just about every element of its design to something recognizable, but none of the puzzle pieces feel like they fit together. Something, something, non-Euclidean geometry. You get the idea. One last thing about Estelle I find impressive visually is that, barring his grab attack, they manage to telegraph his attacks pretty damn well. They can be a bit jarring on the reads at first, but it doesn't take long to figure them out. I bring this up because it would have been very easy to botch the wind-up animations for a model this elaborate, but all things considered, I think they did a pretty excellent job with it. Next up is Melania. I've mentioned before that I think her design is phenomenal, and I meant it. Pale Scarlet and Gold was a fantastic palette choice, and both go well with her pale complexion as well as the splotches of rot that litter her body. The mechanics of her armor are obviously quite complex, but they manage to avoid going so far that they start to feel out of place in a setting like this. This armor was designed by Mia Zakella, so there's a bit of a combination of magic and technology happening here. On one hand, her sword can link up with her arm in order to free her hands up, which you can clearly observe. On the other, she can suddenly control the mechanical arm as soon as it becomes attached to her, even though the connection appears as simple as wedging it into a slot. This is, obviously, straight up magic. But that's okay because Mikula was an Empyrean demigod, meaning we can infer even before we meet him in the DLC that his unalloyed gold had magical properties to it. In fact, we know it does because it also wards off those pesky outer gods. Melenia's design is basically a cross between a Valkyrie and a samurai. Having her fighting style be akin to a samurai makes sense given she's supposed to be something of a foil to Radon, but samurai are also mostly known for being male. There were female samurai, hot, but they are sadly nowhere near as recognized as their male counterparts, especially outside of Japan. This is probably also because female samurai wore identical armor and war paint, or at least that's what I've managed to infer. There's little artistically depicting female samurai that distinguishes them from the males. Valkyrie, however, were exclusively female, and so it makes sense for Melania's visual design to lean more that way so as to establish an identity for her character. Plus, it gives them a reason to give her wings when she goes goddess mode. Combine that with her being descent from Radagon and Merica, and pretty much every element of her design fits together perfectly. There's also something to be said for the blind swordswoman. It's a gimmick as old as time, but... Damn if it's not cool. Be as a Toichi, Kenshi, or that one guy from Aroni Kenshin, blind swords wielders are just... I mean, let's call them what they are. They're fucking badass. And Melania is no exception. She's not even naturally blind, it's just an effect that's occurred from living with the Scarlet Rod inside her, and that adds an element of tragedy to her already fantastic visual design. What else can I say, really? As far as visual designs go, Melania is fantastic. I do wish they'd toned down the butterfly effects of her wings for the fight itself, but it still looks incredible and everything ties together very cohesively. But everyone already knows how cool Melania is, so let's talk about a design that I consider criminally underrated, that being the Crystallians. They're magic rocks that have come to life, they never fail to stand out, but they never feel out of place either. I do question why they appear in the Halleck Tree of all places, but I've already talked about that level and its weird reuse of enemies, so I'm not gonna go there again. Apparently they also served as teachers to the sorcerers of Caria. They almost feel like dragons in Dark Souls, where they just kind of always were, and that's just a fact about the world that doesn't need to be explained. Kind of like Estelle in the Falling Star Beast also. And I like that. 
It adds to the mysticism of the world and really makes you wonder what more there is to learn about them. They obviously have some degree of intelligence and perhaps even wisdom, but do they have a society or culture? It's hard to say, but that's half the fun in games like this. Then there's Rikard. He's incredible. Family. Souls games have often struggled with bosses of this scale, but I think they did a great job with presenting Rikard. His model is very compact, and his movement is extremely limited, which makes it easy for the camera to keep track of him. Not only is this great mechanically, but it also makes it easy to frame the boss's animations, all of which are fantastic. I know this isn't technically visual design, but the presentation of art is often just as important as the art itself, and Souls games have always had a strong grasp of this, with Rikard being no exception. The God-Devouring Serpent is basically a gigantic snake. The design is fairly simple, but it's presented in a way that makes it feel far more grandiose than it otherwise would. This also lends to the big reveal of Rikard in the second phase. He's absolutely disgusting, and yet, you just can't take your eyes off of him. My fiance, for example, is often very squeamish when it comes to body horror, and I thought for sure that she was going to look away when he pulled out the blasphemous blade, but nope. Her eyes were glued to the screen the entire time. That, to me at least, is a sign of some primo quality visual and artistic direction. A completely subjective anecdote, sure, but hopefully one that makes sense. The sudden transformation from a giant serpent to the mad serpentine demigod with arms and a face is pretty mind-blowing. Made all the more grotesque thanks to the little wiggly arms and the similar details lining his weapon, wounds, and so on. Even after the boss, when you come back to the arena to find Rikard's severed head, you can't help but gaze at all the strange, actively moving details in his wounds. Anastasia even claims him to be immortal and that he will one day recover, which is fascinating to consider, not just as a lore and narrative detail, but just wondering what he'll even look like at that point or even part ways through the healing process. Then there's Moog. He honestly might be my favorite visual design in the game. The Omen are already naturally interesting due to their deformities contradicting their godly heritage. Seriously, how did this thing spawn from Godfrey and Merica. Regardless, I think Moog's visual design is incredible. The fact that one of his horns has grown inwards and impaled his right eye, making him partially blind, is fucking metal. But it doesn't seem like it's slowing him down at all. Everything about his garb and even his weapon of choice feels so unholy and utterly foul. Black robes lined with red and gold, a pitchfork which spews fire that causes you to bleed to death, massive black feathered wings. He's basically the devil and I'm here for it. Then there's his phase two transition. I know I talked about it already with the OST, but... I mean, come on, that is so fucking cool. I feel like if Elden Ring has a singular villain, barring the Outer Gods and maybe the Lonesome Dung Eater, it would have to be Moog. All the other main players are either insane like Radon and Godric, just want to be left alone like Melania or Renala, trying to set things right like Ronnie, Mikula, or otherwise indisposed like Merica. Moog, on the other hand, is actively trying to establish dominion over the lands between by aligning with an outer god and forcing his half-Imperium brother to be his consort, or so we thought. Regardless, Moog's definitely not being invited to the family get-together at Eld's giving. Melania and Radon may bicker at the table, but at least they aren't trying to R-word one another. I hope. The point is, Moog's devilish aesthetic with the extreme use of a red and black color palette is very fitting. It also helps to give him a very distinct visual appeal compared to many of the other game's characters and bosses. Elden Ring is fairly reserved with its use of highly saturated colors, so the moments where colors like this are present always stands out, chief among them being Moog. I will say though, as good as Elden Ring looks, there are definitely a few bad apples in this basket of design. They're few and far between, but they make their presence known. And on that note, let's talk about the Godskin Noble. What in the fuck happened here? This thing just... It looks ridiculous, and I don't understand it at all. I thought the Godskin Apostle, oh, sorry, the Godskin Apostle, was terrifically designed, but the Noble is just, I mean, I, I feel like this speaks for itself. It's just so absurd and goofy that it feels like it was drawn up by a child. Like, am I supposed to be laughing at this thing? 
because if so, why not just make him really easy so as to cement his role as one of the most entertainingly goofy bosses of the game? I mean, for God's sake, even Pinwheel had a more intimidating design. What's even more strange is just how conflicting this design's tone is with the actual lore of the Godskins. The Godskins are a seriously strange and eerie lot, devoutly following an elusive and mysterious queen who sought the very death of the gods themselves. Honestly, she doesn't sound particularly dissimilar from Velka, the goddess of sin and retribution in Dark Souls. This cult literally sewed clothing from the flesh of gods they slaughtered with the aid of their cursed black flame. That's pretty fucking metal to say the least. It's unclear what gods they even killed, but for the sake of this point, that's not entirely relevant. The point is, the tone of the lore and narrative clashes directly with that of the godskin noble, who honestly animates like a character from Cuphead, Steamboat Willie, the Looney Tunes, or fuck, even Kingdom Hearts. What on earth is even happening anymore? But there is one design that I have mocked and ridiculed throughout this critique that I can no longer go without talking about. You guys should already know what it is. I'm referring, of course, to none other than Merica's Empyrean Shadow, the Roman Reigns Big Doggo Woof Woof himself, the furriest of anime furry bait to ever go yif yif. Oh my god, I can't believe I fucking said that. The edgiest edgehog to ever edge, Malekith the Black Blade. Alright, so in the spirit of fairness, I want to make it clear that my take regarding Malekith's design is completely subjective, and I am more than aware that I am very much in the minority regarding it. That being said, I'm still going to give you the reasons I feel the way I do, so hopefully you can come out of this at least understanding why it is I've turned this anime dog into my proverbial punching bag. Malekith is a wolfman with literally edgy black armor and a hulking black greatsword with red energy and from it. His title is the Black Blade, and he wields destined death. Even Spawn would blush at the sheer edge of this furry motherfucker. Alright, look, I can absolutely get behind Edge when it's done well. As ridiculous as certain interpretations of them are, Spawn, Ghost Rider, Red Hood, Deathstroke, Punisher, Daredevil, and Batman are all phenomenal characters when they're done right. But they're also complete and total jokes of characters when they are done oh so poorly. For me, what kills my ability to take Malekith seriously is just how seriously he's being played up, all the while having so many clashing aesthetics. How about another joke, viewer? What do you get when you cross a mentally ill loner with Sif, Artorius, Guts, Ludwig, Gale, and the Nameless King? You get something that none of us fucking deserve. Come to think of it, literally every character whom Malekith draws inspiration from all feature brooding backstories specifically inspired by Berserk. Like, seriously, I know Miyazaki loves Berserk, and I get it, but it's become a meme at this point. Unfortunately, whereas characters like Artorius, Ludwig, Gale, and so on still manage to feel wholly original, Malekith feels like the kind of character design you would find in a game like Code Vein. We fully transitioned from badass edge to a preteen emo soulsborn berserk OC. Please don't steal. Is emo even a thing anymore? Sorry kiddos, I'm old. The point is that from the moment I saw Malekith's Phase 2 cutscene, the illusions were so immediately and abundantly transparent that I honestly lost the ability to take him seriously and buy into his design as an Elden Ring original, let alone as a genuine threat. From the OGs to this OC, Malekith is one of the least original characters this studio has ever produced. He copies Ludwig and Artorius' cutscenes almost beat for beat, visually and narratively, as well as hurling energy from his weapon, except this time they're a dark saturated crimson instead of a bright pale teal. The wolf motif, which in the context of Souls games was of course made famous by Artorius, is obviously a core element of Malekith's design being the framing for which every other detail is fitted into. He flies around swinging his sword all over the place in a manner not too dissimilar to Gale from the Ring City, however the difference here is that there's nothing holding Malekith back other than his own intentional delays from swinging his sword as if it were a stick that didn't weigh so much as a pound despite him being an emaciated wolf. Gale, on the other hand, had a lot more heave and stress even as far as his final phase, as many swings flip and leaps as Gale did, there's not a single animation of his which sticks out as strangely breaking of the grounded nature of these games. Malekith? That's half his moveset at the minimum. 
Come to think of it, even his sword bears something of a resemblance to Gale's. And to top it all off, Malekith has the Nameless King's very distinct fashion of hair. I genuinely have no idea why. Now, in fairness, if this were the only visual callback, it would be completely fine on its own. I love the Nameless King as much as the next guy, so hey, whatever, but why, pray tell, is the wolf's hair so much longer on his head than it is anywhere else on his body? And yes, I know, even the Nameless King was inspired by Berserk, but I already made this point. Literally everything that goes on to inspire Malekith was itself inspired by Berserk. This character is completely unoriginal. I understand the inspiration's goal and intent behind this design. They wanted an homage hearkening back to so many elements of the prior games that would pay a sort of respect to them as this most recent journey drew to a close. I can respect that, however I think they tried to include far too many design elements that could reasonably accommodate a single boss's design, and I feel like that shows. Assuming I'm correct in my understanding of the reasoning for this visual design, I sincerely wish that I could look at Malekith in a more positive light. I love all of the things that Malekith is trying to pay tribute to, from Berserk all the way to Dark Souls 3. But those things being great does not mean Malekith is great by extension. I can see through the illusion and past the illusions, and there's very little of substance beyond them. Frankly, I expected much better from the studio responsible for bringing to life designs like Artorius, Ludwig, Gale and the Nameless King. But I don't want to end this section on a sour note, because like I said, Elden Ring's artistic direction is, on the whole, pretty damn magnificent. And a couple of outliers is never going to change that. So, let's talk about the environments for a bit. Elden Ring's environments, on the whole, are genuinely excellent, with an immense variety in aesthetics and locales to keep the world feeling fresh and new in the many hours you're likely to spend exploring it. The variety goes a long way in bolstering the notion that you're an adventurer trekking across a simultaneously forsaken and yet nevertheless enchanting world. Further adding to this sense of adventure is the air tree, which serves as a constant backdrop so as to give you an idea of where you're going to end up the moment that you start the game. This thing is visible from seemingly even the most remote corners of this world, and yet there will be areas where the air tree is no longer visible, such as the many dungeons and the underground portion of the map. Not only does this create an effectively isolated setting within these more remote locations, but it also serves as something of a break from the side of the air tree so as not to clog every frame with constant golden backdrops. The Halic Tree also stands out thanks to its backdrop featuring a similar and yet simultaneously quite different magical tree aesthetic. Speaking of areas cut off from the air tree aesthetic, the ancient underground cities have to be among my favorite environments in the game by far. They're honestly magnificent. I took the elevator thinking I was going to be taken to yet another generic dungeon or something, so imagine my surprise when it turned out I was going into an environment with more stars than the Hollywood Walk of Fame. These areas strike an incredible balance between fairy tale folklore and straight up cosmic horror. It's beautiful, but you always get the feeling that something horrific must have happened for things to turn out this way. There's a lot of history to uncover here, and you can tell that just at a glance. Honestly, I would have really enjoyed seeing more of these environments revisited in the DLC. The Cerulean Coast almost hits the mark, but it's just not quite what I had in mind. Finally, I just gotta mention, the cutscene cinematography in this game is fucking stellar. Except for Malekith's. Which, I mean, hey, that's pretty much what you would expect from a FromSoft title. It almost feels like the camera itself carries the sort of reverence for the game's greater bosses and that it understands the magnitude of things like seeing Ronnie's two fingers and inheriting the frenzied flame. There's a lot of drawn out panning still shots and not a lot of cuts. You can tell the cinematographers want you to really take things in as they're presented, and I respect the hell out of that. As much as I may criticize Radagon and the Elden Beast, even their cutscenes look tremendous. There's no denying it. Seeing Merica crucified on the Elden Ring and Radagon raising the hammer I imagine was used to invoke the Shattering, it's played up every bit as much as it deserves. I will say some of the DLC cutscenes went on for a bit too long. Mesmer's Phase 2 transition was genuinely incredible, but... Also, why is it this long? But you know what, it's fine. Renala's Phase 2 cutscene in particular is downright awe-inspiring. I really appreciate the fact that even the worst of the Remembrance bosses have such exceptional presentation to them. Except Malekith. Look, I'm not apologizing. Malekith fucking sucks.